I just got called out by the Secretary of State. <laughs> Truly a great start to our Pride convening. Well, hi, everybody. Um, good afternoon and happy Pride. My name is Jessica Stern, and I'm the US Special Envoy for the Advancement of the Human Rights of Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, Queer, and Intersex Persons. And it is a pleasure to welcome you to the State Department. All right, I'm gonna kick it off with some housekeeping notes and then I'm gonna offer you some brief remarks. So first of all, I'm gonna let you know what the agenda is today. Um, after I speak, we have the great pleasure of hearing from Secretary Blinken. Um, then we will have a fireside chat with Ambassador Catherine Tai, the US Trade Representative. Following Catherine Tai, we will hear from Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield, the US Representative to the United Nations. And then we will have a break to absorb it all. Um, following the break, we will hear from Counselor Clinton White from USAID, and then we'll go into our first panel. Then we have the pleasure of hearing from Ambassador Eric Garcetti, our ambassador to India. Then we will have another break, and then we will round it out with the second panel and finally closing remarks by our Undersecretary, Azra Zaya. How does that sound? <laughs> Um, two other quick housekeeping notes. The first is uh, the first part of our event when the cabinet officials are speaking is open to the press. Um, we'll notify you when that transition occurs. Um, and if anybody has any needs about restrooms or other facilities, please see one of the staff that are flanking the sides of the room. With that, I get to tell you that today is a historic event. This is the first event in US history when three, LG, three cabinet officials will publicly explain why the human rights and well-being of LGBTQI plus persons matters to US foreign policy interests, including, in just a few minutes, powerful remarks from Secretary Blinken on the work we do at the State Department to protect LGBTQI plus persons around the world. It is also the first time in the Biden administration that so many senior officials across foreign policy and foreign assistance agencies will publicly and collectively articulate a whole of government approach to, why, to explain why this work is so essential. And to start this day, it is my great pleasure to read a letter from President Biden in honor of this momentous occasion. I send my warmest greetings to everyone gathered for the State Department's convening on US foreign policy, national security, inclusive development, and the human rights of LGBTQI plus persons. The contributions of LGBTQI plus people have been critical to the progress we have made so far in the pursuit of equality, justice, and inclusion. Their bravery is a source of inspiration and hope to all those seeking a life true to who they are. But all too often, LGBTQI plus people, especially trans individuals, face challenges for living authentically and proudly. Their lives, their safety, and their dignity are put at risk. They worry about their future, and they are made to feel less than others. That is unacceptable. And that is why it has been a priority for my administration since day one to uphold and bolster the rights of LGBTQI plus people across America and around the world. To all those attending the State Department's convening today, thank you. Thank you for your steadfast support of this vibrant and brave community which lives proudly all over the world. You know, like I know, that protecting the rights and liberties of LGBTQI plus people strengthens democracy, enhances security, supports economic development, and protects public health, both at home and abroad. Your commitment to the global LGBTQI plus community is helping to forge a future in which everyone, no matter who they are, or who they love, or where they call home, can live with dignity. 
The work you do truly matters, and it reminds us there is nothing beyond our capacity when we act together. Today, as you gather during Pride Month for this important event, please know that your president and my entire administration has your back. We see you for who you are, made in the image of God and deserving of dignity, respect, and support. Thank you for all of your efforts to promote and protect the rights and liberties of LGBTQI plus people. I wish you a wonderful and a productive convening. Since I became Special Envoy three plus years ago, I've met thousands of LGBTQI plus human rights defenders and hundreds of civil society organizations. And across countries and themes, one request has persisted, that the United States use its role as a world leader to counter discrimination and violence against LGBTQI plus persons. Today's forum answers that question by bringing together leading US policymakers and decision makers to help probe these essential issues and ask what we all can do. We've convened this discussion to answer a fundamental question about good governance and foreign policy. How do we protect the most vulnerable? This is especially important in a time of enormous transformations for LGBTQI plus people, a time when backlash and progress seem to coexist. Here are three themes to look for this afternoon. First, LGBTQI plus issues are not only relevant to human rights debates, to gender equality, or to public health programming for key populations. LGBTQI plus issues intersect with every foreign policy priority of the US government, from national security to inclusive development to public health countering terrorism and countering corruption. Second, we are living through a global backlash against equality for LGBTQI plus persons. In the past year, my office has tracked anti-LGBTQI plus bills in every region of the world. Every day, we are contacted by LGBTQI plus people who fear violence and persecution. The backlash against the fragile successes of the global LGBTQI plus movement is undermining equality for all. And third, this backlash undermines good governance, democracy, prosperity, and equality worldwide. We often say that LGBTQI plus people are a canary in the coal mine, but it's worth repeating. When we see politicians or special interest groups target LGBTQI plus persons, the human rights of all suffer and everybody loses. To segue, I wanna tell you about something that we're launching today. We cannot simply talk about the world today with also talking about actions that we have to take to change trajectories towards justice and equality. President Biden directed foreign affairs agencies to do just that in one of his very first actions as president. Today, I am pleased to announce the release of the progress report on implementing the presidential memorandum on advancing the human rights of LGBTQI plus persons around the world. It highlights the US government's efforts to protect human rights, public health, economic opportunities, and security of LGBTQI plus persons in 2023. Please read the report when it goes live this afternoon and share with us your ideas about how we can do even more this year. As I conclude, I'd like to share with you my hopes for today. First, I hope that we end today with a fuller understanding of the areas in which governments and civil society are making progress for LGBTQI plus equality and where we require more effort. Second, I hope we will be humble because the US and we all have so much to learn. And perhaps most importantly, I hope we will make a compelling case for inclusion and justice year round and not just during June. And now it is my great pleasure to welcome Secretary Blinken to the podium to begin our series of discussions. Thank you for joining us and let's get to work.
Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Please have a seat. First, let me say to my friend, Catherine Tai, welcome, welcome. Thank you, Catherine, for being here with us today. We're all looking forward to hearing from you. Now, I'm usually the one who gets called out by Jessica. <laughs> so this was a great moment to actually get to return the favor. But I have to tell you, and I think pretty much everyone in this room knows it, uh, we have an extraordinary force of nature in Jessica leading our efforts around the world. I couldn't be more grateful for it. The difference that she and her team are making every day in ways big and small is incredibly powerful. And I get a chance to see that up close. And uh, you'll be hearing more about that through the course of this afternoon. But Jessica, to you, to the entire team, thank you, thank you, thank you. And for so many in this room, I could say the same thing, because this is an extraordinary community of people who are working every day, not just on this day, but every day, to make a real difference. Um, on his first day in office, and you heard the letter from the President, but on his very first day in office, President Biden issued an executive order stating that, and I quote, all human beings should be treated with respect and dignity and should be able to live without fear, no matter who they are or whom they love. It's as simple as that. LGBTQI plus rights are human rights, and our government has a responsibility to defend them, to promote them here and everywhere. Upholding these rights is crucial to safeguarding and accelerating our renewal at home, our ability to stand up for human rights and democracy internationally is also tied directly to whether we're strong on these fronts here in our own country. So much of what we do, uh, we see the connections between what we're doing and how we're doing at home, what we're doing and how we're doing abroad. And this is no different. It's also profoundly in our national interest and vital to our national security, which gets us to what Jessica shared with you earlier, really the focus that we're bringing uh, today. But it's in our national security interest to stand up for LGBTQI plus persons around the world. When nations came together 75 years ago, they affirmed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights respect for the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family. That's the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. And we see that here at the State Department every single day. Countries that respect the rights of every individual tend to be more stable, more healthy, more democratic, more prosperous. Those that discriminate against LGBTQI plus persons <coughs> tend to be less free and tend to be less equal. The correlation is as clear as day. 64 countries currently criminalize consensual sex, uh, same-sex conduct between adults. In 11 of them, having same-sex relations is punishable by death. Last year, you all know this, Uganda enacted a law further criminalizing consensual same-sex conduct with penalties that included imprisonment, including life imprisonment. People convicted of so-called aggravated homosexuality face the death penalty. In Hungary, the government is smearing scapegoating, stigmatizing LGBTQI plus persons, vilifying them with degrading labels, denying them equal rights, normalizing violence against them. Two months ago, Iraq's parliament passed legislation that punishes same-sex relations with up to 15 years in prison. Anyone who engages in so-called promotion of homosexuality can be imprisoned for 10 years. In Indonesia, the parliament passed a new criminal code banning extramarital sex. In a nation where same-sex couples cannot marry, these laws effectively make all same-sex conduct illegal, and they undermine privacy for all Indonesians. Since 2021, the State Department has helped lead a whole of U.S. government effort to ensure that every person, everywhere, 
can live free from violence and discrimination with their equal rights respected. We're defending and promoting LGBTQI plus rights around the world, and we're doing it in several key ways, and that's what I wanted to just spend a few minutes highlighting for you today. First, we're applying diplomatic pressure to urge governments to reverse discriminatory laws and practices. Seven nations have decriminalized consensual same-sex conduct over the past two years. Greece, Liechtenstein, Thailand voted to legalize marriage equality this year. More countries are banning so-called conversion therapy. Now, first and foremost, these achievements are possible because of incredibly courageous human rights defenders and government partners on the ground. But I believe America's support is indispensable. When we engage, sometimes publicly, sometimes privately, sometimes both, when we share our own knowledge and experience, we can and we do achieve change. Second, where human rights abuses are carried out against LGBTI plus persons, we hold the perpetrators accountable. When Uganda enacted its Anti-Homosexuality Act, we redirected U.S. government assistance so that it doesn't go to those carrying out this abusive policy, while at the same time increasing aid to Ugandan uh, people who need it more than ever before in the LGBTI plus community. We sanctioned Ugandan officials who were involved in gross human rights violations. We ended Uganda's eligibility for beneficial trade status under the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act until, until it repeals the legislation and addresses its human rights situation. We remain committed to partnering with the people of Uganda, as we've done for years with investments in improving health care and education, expanding economic opportunity, strengthening accountability and the rule of law. We'll make sure that our resources continue to lift up the Ugandan people, not enable their repression. Third, we're increasing protections for vulnerable LGBTI plus persons, and we're doing that again around the world. We've expanded access here in the United States to the Refugee Admissions Program. We've got new options like NGO referrals and sponsorship by individuals and organizations. And we're also providing financial and settlement support. We've increased access to mental and physical health services for refugees, including from the LGBTQI plus community. We've strengthened training for refugees and asylum officers to better serve those communities, precisely at a time when this community is increasingly vulnerable, it's important, urgent, that we step up to provide the support, the help, the assistance that we can, and to do that in a very deliberate way. We're also strongly supporting LGBTQI plus human rights organizations, and we're doing it on the ground, where every single day these organizations are acting at tremendous risk uh, and showing through their actions what can actually be accomplished. We're proud to administer the Global Equality Fund. This provides essential aid to the work of groups in more than 100 countries around the world. Finally, we're doubling down on our efforts to bring LGBTQI plus rights and perspectives to the fore in multilateral and regional organizations. For example, the UN Human Rights Council, we brought our strong support to the first ever UN resolution to condemn and combat discrimination against and violence against intersex persons. 47 countries from every part of the world actually co-sponsored the resolution. The Council adopted it in April without a single no vote. That's, that, that result is actually the product of roll up your sleeves diplomacy that our team engaged in. In Geneva, and I'm very proud that we got it. Today, I'm announcing that the United States is updating our own interpretation of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. This is one of the key treaties committing nations to upholding universal rights. That means that starting from now, the United States considers sexual orientation and gender identity as covered by this treaty. In, in our regular reporting to the Council on Human Rights, we will continue to include incidents of discrimination or abuse committed against LGBTQI plus persons, now with the clear framework of this well-supported interpretation. That will further empower 
our efforts. We've come a long way here at home and in our advocacy for rights around the world. But you heard it from Jessica, you know it, you live it every day. We also continue to face a long road ahead. This community knows better than most, maybe better than anyone. Change doesn't happen overnight. We don't expect attitudes and laws to transform in one fell swoop everywhere. But here's what we do know. Here's what you know better than anyone. Our voice, our partnership, our experience can help make a difference, can help accelerate change, can literally help to save lives. That's why I'm so proud of the work that we do, proud of the work that you do. That's why I'm grateful that all of you are here today, this afternoon, for what I think is an important moment, an important conversation. Um, because ultimately, any movement is only as strong as the people who make it up. That's all of you and so many others that you work with and represent. And as I'm looking around this room, and knowing folks who are also tuning in. Um, and as I look around the world and get to hear from so many people uh, that I meet with the extraordinary privilege of helping to represent the country around the world, what I see above all else is strength, resilience, determination. From our diplomatic colleagues who know that none of this gets done alone, from our State Department team, many of whom are with us today, whose members show almost superhuman stamina in their own advocacy. Leaders from the private sector, from academia, from international organizations, who are teaming up with us to deliver, to deliver a better future. And especially from the activists on the front lines who are indispensable to the safety and security of LGBT plus persons around the world. And you know, undertake their work at extraordinary personal risk. Each of you is an inspiration. Each of you is a motivation. Each of you, in so many ways, is our conscience. Activists, all of our civil society partners, you know how much work remains to achieve full equality and full rights. But our promise is this. We will be with you every step of the way. We'll persevere with you. We'll listen to you. We'll learn from you. We'll help resource and support your fight. And we'll bring our strength together with yours so that finally, together, we can build a world where all people are genuinely free, free to be who they are, free to love who they love. Thank you, and have a great afternoon. Again. Next, I am honored to introduce Ambassador Catherine Tai, the United States Trade Representative. 
Ambassador Tai has led a transformation in the trade and economic policy space by focusing on and emphasizing a new trade policy framework that centers workers, marginalized people, and communities. She has broadened the U.S. Trade Representative's office outreach to historically underserved communities, including indigenous groups, communities of color, and LGBTQI plus individuals. She has strengthened the U.S. International Trade Commission, charging it to study and develop new data for the first time around the impact of trade on underserved communities. Finally, she has crafted and implemented innovative new policies, including a pioneering new trade enforcement model, not a term I say every day, for global supply chains. This model holds all actors, including U.S. corporations, accountable and sets a new benchmark in U.S. and global trade policy. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Catherine Tai. Can you hear me? Yes. Ambassador Tai, I think you have some fans in the audience. Oh my gosh, what an honor to be here with all of you. Excellent. Um, Ambassador Tai, you are the President's principal trade advisor, negotiator, and spokesperson on trade issues around the world. I want to recognize that at the outset of our conversation, and that your presence in today's convening um, it's remarkable, actually, because historically, talking about trade policy in LGBTQI policy conversations has not been central. And I would say this is probably a first. <laughs> President Biden and you have changed this trajectory with a national trade policy agenda that makes the connections between inclusive workplaces, including for LGBTQI plus persons, and better trade policy and practice for the US. So can we start with the basics? What does the USTR do, and how is our trade policy relevant for the human rights of LGBTQI plus persons? Well, thank you so much for having me, and it's really an honor to be here to share a stage with you, Jessica. Uh, part of me wants to turn the tables uh, and um, uh, to let me interview you for today, but um, uh, to answer your question, um, there are a lot of ways I come at this uh, because it turns out that not a lot of people know about USTR. We are small, uh, we can be mighty, um, and uh, we're very, very specialized, uh, but we care deeply about what we do. And um, I actually think that my title is maybe um, one of the most self-explanatory ones. Um, I represent the interests of the United States in trade. And that's trade with the rest of the world. And that's the United States the entire United States. That's the United States economy. And for us, it's really important to unpack what is the economy. And I think what is the economy is a question that we're used to asking. But I think it's, it really misses the most important point, which is who is the economy? And the answer to that is our economy is made up of our people. And as a matter of economic policy, however you want to talk about it, and I know there's the whole um, uh, study and discipline of economics behind it that can get very, very abstract um, and theoretical. But at root, the point of economic policy is to create more benefits and opportunity for your people. And so a lot of what we're doing at USTR, uh, under President Biden's charge to lead a new kind of US trade policy, one that puts workers at the center, is to really keep reminding ourselves that what we are trying to do in trade policy, whether they are negotiations, enforcement matters, they are dialogues, they're participating in forums like the World Trade Organization, the G20, the G7, APEC, something that I do uh, with Tony, um, is for the benefit of our people. And it's through that lens then that you start to examine, and it becomes really relevant, this question of who are your people? And I think it's really self-evident. You are our people. Our people are our people. 
And that includes all of the people in our society, in our economy, who feel like they aren't seen, who feel like they aren't heard, um, who feel like somehow the power imbalance is in favor of other people. And so um, this inclusivity piece that we carry into trade policy is out of a recognition that trade policy has been a part of an international economic policy toolbox that has generated a lot of wealth over the past many decades, but has also had major blind spots and has also allowed for that wealth to accumulate in certain places and in certain parts of our societies. So um, I'm really delighted to be here because it means that you, Special Envoy, you at the State Department see us as USDR, small, very good at the one thing that we do, and you see the change that we're trying to bring, which was to take a trade, economic policy, and also foreign policy conversation, and to bring it back to first principles, which is who should benefit from our economic policies, our people. And I think since I'm here in the house of the State Department and American foreign policy, who should benefit from our foreign policy and our national security policies, again, it comes back to basics, it's our people. Feel free to give that a round of applause. For those of us who are not economists, that was a really accessible way of breaking down what you do and why it's relevant to not only LGBTQI people, but to the broader mandate of the State Department. Um, it's resonant to me because although I spent much of my career working on human rights, I know that human rights arguments just don't resonate with everybody. And sometimes you need to talk in economic terms. So given the context we're discussing here, can you walk us through an example of what this looks like in practice, especially in relation to marginalized people, such as LGBTQI people? Certainly. So let me begin by filling out a little bit of uh, what you introduced earlier, which is uh, in our first weeks at USTR, um, and this is in 2021, uh, coming off of a, a deeply traumatic 2020, uh, when um, so many really, really hard, um, really painful things happen to all of us at the same time. Um, one of the first questions we wanted to do using the policy tools available to USDR was we wanted to ask the question, and we asked it to our sister agency, the US International Trade Commission. Now, they're a commission, I think, um, at full force, there are six commissioners. Um, they're mostly economists and lawyers. They're econ nerds. Everybody respects them for taking their jobs really seriously, being independent, and um, uh, giving questions that are presented to them a lot of uh, integrity in terms of their process and their approach. And the question we wanted to ask was this. In all the time that we've been doing trade policy, um, could, they, could they look back at the data that's available and tell us what has been the impact of those trade policies? And more particularly, could they tell us what the distributional effects of our trade policies, what have they been on different parts of America? And again, bringing it back to different segments of our population. Um, rural communities versus urban communities, men versus women, um, the LGBTQI plus, um, communities of color. Um, what could they tell us? And um, their first reaction when we told them we wanted to request this investigation was, oh my god, that sounds really hard. No one's ever asked us those questions before. We're not really sure how we would approach it. And we said, well, um, this is why everybody loves you, is that you, know, you will do your very best to try to figure out how to respond. And it's actually really, really important for us to know how are we doing with our trade policies? Are we going gangbusters? Is everybody doing great? In which case, we should just keep doing what we're doing. Um, but anywhere where we could be doing better, we want to know where that is and how we could be doing better. So the first, the first finding that came back from the USITC was um, expected, which is, you know what, you've never asked this question before, and in fact, where we collect our data, 
we've actually not been specifically asking this question either. So we don't have enough of the granular data that would give us a very good understanding of what the distributional effects of our trade policies have been. However, we're still going to do our best. Based on the more um, uh, crude data that we have, based on the questions that we have been asking, what do we see as the distributional effects? And what we saw is they're really uneven and that there are communities and parts of America that have done less well than other parts. And maybe to put it another way, some parts of America that have been harmed by trade policies where others have benefited. And uh, in the initial uh, assessment, it was um, women, communities of color, non-college educated white men. And I think that reinforced a feeling that we already had that broke along these lines in terms of explaining why support for US trade policies was weaker in certain parts of America than in other parts of America. So that gave us the confidence then to say, we need to be doing this differently. We need to be doing it, it being trade policy, with an eye to more inclusive benefits, which starts with a more inclusive process. And through all of this, the um, conversation around different communities that we need to be paying attention to because of uh, where they sit in American society and culture, where they sit in the economy. Um, the LGBTQI plus community, absolutely. The disability community, women, rural communities. Um, all are vulnerable in a way to being left out or forgotten or purposefully not included. And so we know we need to work harder to understand what the specific challenges are that face each of these communities because while they all share the quality of having been marginalized in some important ways, the challenges each community faces are different. So then we have to invest the time to understand what are the special characteristics of each community, the special characteristics of those barriers that the people in these communities face, to then figure out how do we link that into our trade policies, and how do we, how do we harness the power of the American economy, how do we harness the power of America as, a, as an international and foreign policy leader to uh, cooperate with other countries and economies on more inclusive outcomes because it turns out that um, this feeling that trade and economic policies have not been inclusive enough is something that we share with almost all of our trading partners. And that's been, that's been the hook for having the conversation. And you're right, I think that first of all, LGBTQI plus persons rights in economic realms is, 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 is just a core moral issue. It is the right thing to do as people, societies, and economies. But if you need for us to translate it into economic and trade speak, we can do that too. And you know, depending on our audience, we're always trying to figure out how to be most persuasive and effective. What I would say is this, is that when you have um, discrimination, violence, prejudice against a community like the LGBTQI plus community, one that is talented, that is mighty, that has so much to contribute to your economy, that that kind of you know, discrimination, systemic structures that oppress this part of your people, it is a tax on your economic development opportunity. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, um, when we talk to our business community, um, they will say, look, uh, those types of policies interfere with our ability to do robust business. And this is one time where you know I think that we really get on board with uh, the business perspective, which is if they also see this as a kind of a tax on opportunity, then we have common cause to take on these types of policies to Secretary Blinken's point, both abroad and at home. Thank you for explaining that. Uh, 
I just want to say as a model, I really appreciate what you've outlined for us, which is that you were uncertain about the concrete impacts of US trade policy, so you went looking for data to answer fundamental questions, and when you got the answers, you started doing trade differently. That's sort of the ask that marginalized populations have everywhere, that we actually seek data to understand whether public policies reach them, and then when we find that they don't, we change our policies. So that feels like a best practice. <laughs> Unfortunately, you refer to laws that have a criminalizing effect and laws that actually undermine economic potential. Well, we know that there are many countries around the world that are undermining LGBTQI people's ability to work and to contribute equally to the economy and to benefit from the economy as well. Um, and so one example where USTR has had an outsized visibility, I would say, is Uganda in the response to the Anti-Homosexuality Act. And I think a lot of people in our audience today and many people watching from home are familiar with the steps that you've taken on AGOA, the African Growth and Opportunity Act. I'd like to invite you to explain the actions that you took, how you got there, and why it mattered. Great. So um, this is a sad story on so many levels. Um, we knew that there is a history of um, this type of legislation um, and policy. Uh, in Uganda in particular, I'm just going to talk about Uganda, but to Secretary Blinken's point and your point earlier, it's something that we're seeing all around the world, including here at home. And um, in, uh, in the normal course of uh, administering AGOA, which is very busy, there's an annual review process where every single AGOA beneficiary country gets reviewed for whether or not they're meeting the eligibility criteria to continue to participate and enjoy the benefits of the AGOA program. And uh, my team came up to me and said, um, the legislation has actually made it across the finish line. And it was one of those moments where I thought, oh my gosh, how could this have happened? Now, I mean, we all know how it happened, right? Like step by step by step by step, it keeps moving forward. And um, members of the community came in um, with a lot of concern uh, to talk to me about it, to brief me up on exactly how it happened. And, um, you know, part of my thinking at the time was, uh, gosh, uh, I wish that we could have turned back time and that we had tools for and that we had, we, had, we had raised the flag on, you know, if you continue down this path. But I didn't have the chance to do that. I am actually quite sure that um, our, uh, our experts uh, closer to the ground had opportunity to do it and did it along the way. Uh, but for me, I thought, well, you know, there might have been an opportunity for me to come in at the kind of ministerial level. But here we are. And then the question was, well, um, under AGOA, what does this mean? I remember at the time having the conversation uh, with the community and the stakeholders who came in to say, you know, these decisions aren't unilaterally made by USDR. Um, they do have to reflect an administration consensus. Um, so uh, we, we, we were in the process of the annual reviews. And as we were uh, canvassing the interagency, that stands for the administration on this particular issue, what we found was unanimity. Mm -hmm. right? And you don't, you don't know until you have that engagement. Um, there is a, a human rights requirement uh, under AGOA that gave us the hook to going to Uganda. And we had warnings because um, uh, their suspension from the program didn't take place until January 1st. So at that point, we sent letters. Um, I had opportunities to engage with counterparts or their deputies along the way to pull them aside and to say, this is what's going to happen unless you're able to course correct before January 1. And, um, you know, despite those engagements, January 1 comes and um, there's no change. And in fact, they're now fully implementing the law. And we are, we are seeing all of the parade of horribles that we knew were going to come. Um, so as of today, uh, June of 2024, uh, Uganda's AGOA benefits and its participation has been suspended. 
Now, that leaves us then with a the question because um, there have been consequences then, real consequences in an important US-Africa economic program and trade program for Uganda. But now what? Right? We, we see this actually across the Goa when it comes to suspending participation. The point isn't actually to kick partners out. The point is to um, encourage the conditions for bringing them back in. And so with Uganda, I think that the question that we have is the, the goal isn't to punish the country and all of its people. Because by doing that, we're also punishing the people who are trying to empower and to help. And so the question is, is this tool on its own enough? I know it's not the only tool that we deploy. But colleagues at the State Department, at USAID, and a lot of other agencies um, also have ways to try to encourage Uganda to come back into the fold. Um, but it's something that's very much on our minds because um, the key point is um, how do we how do we make Uganda safe again for the LGBTQI plus community there? And how do we make the case to Uganda that uh, it is in their own best economic interest and the best interest of their economic partnership with the United States? So AGO is a really important tool. I, I want to reinforce um, uh, how the Biden administration's values were expressed through the decision making in the last eligibility review cycle. And then I also just want to let you know we remain open to that conversation around um, how we encourage Uganda to change its policies. And I know that it is not easy and it's multifaceted, um, but it needs to be a conversation that we continue to have. Thank you, Ambassador. I had the pleasure of meeting with the government of Uganda alongside your extraordinary team. After the um, government of Uganda lost its AGOA eligibility, and I just want to affirm what you said. It was probably one of the harder meetings I've ever done. Um, there's, there was no joy in removing Uganda's eligibility for AGOA status. Um, but the framework that USTR created was actually not limited to the Anti-Homosexuality Act in Uganda, which is something that I think needs emphasis. It was actually a methodology that asked the government of Uganda to look at the broader human rights situation in Uganda and take corrective action. And within that, the AHA was specifically named. Um, I want to, I want to go from your very holistic answer on that to a final question. Um, I just spoke with some members of the media this morning and I got a question that I imagine you've received many times, which is, um, is the U.S. politicizing human rights by bringing it into trade policy? And I have a feeling that this is a question you are very comfortable answering. But what I hear you saying is that as part of the trade benefits that you seek for the United States, you try to ensure that everyone is a beneficiary of the financial benefits of effective trade. And that there are certain models that USTR uses to ensure that that holds true. Could you expand on that? Absolutely, and I think you've teed it very, very, very nicely for me. In a program like AGOA in particular, and I think that this is, um, you know, a, a, a foundational program, it's a preference program. We provide our developing country partners with unilateral tariff preferences, uh, preferential access into the U.S. market, not on all goods, but actually under AGOA. AGOA, I think, is our... Uh, preference program with the largest scope in terms of uh, the goods access into the U.S. market. We don't give these preferences away for free. We don't give them away to everybody. Um, we choose our partners. In the case of AGOA, it's the countries of sub-Saharan Africa. Because 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we identified sub-Saharan Africa as an important part of the world that we wanted to partner with to, to stimulate economic development and growth 
and be, be there uh, to have a program with these countries. But um, trade and economics um, and these types of programs are not valueless. These programs reflect who we are as a people, as a polity, as uh, an economy. And so there are eligibility requirements that relate to uh, political pluralism, that relate to human rights, that relate to internationally recognized worker rights. Um, and uh, uh, we have the right to require the respect for these types of values if you are going to enjoy the preferences of a special relationship with the United States. And so uh, I don't see it as politicization at all. Uh, from our perspective, these are our values, and these are the values that we respect and reward in our partners where they can meet us on those values. And as a practical matter, having those values line up creates a much more fluid compatibility and interoperability between our economies. So um, I think it's actually um, uh, not politicization at all. It's deeply practical. Uh, and it is about how um, economic programs um, have to reflect the values of a society. Who feels like they got a master's in economics? <laughs> um, I learned so much from this conversation. I really appreciate your joining us and speaking at the State Department, Ambassador Tai. And I think I will take a number of things away from this conversation, as I imagine many of you will. But one component that we don't hear often enough is that when we use the formal terms of economic development, we should actually be asking who are the people behind the economic development? And are they beneficiaries? And I think Ambassador Tai made clear why we want everybody to benefit from economic growth and opportunity. Please give her a round of applause. Thank you so much. We're going from one superstar to another, and it is now my enormous privilege to introduce Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield, the representative of the United States to the United Nations. Ambassador Thomas-Greenfield has a distinguished career in the Foreign Service and has been a vocal advocate for inclusion, diversity, and human rights at the United Nations. She has championed UN resolutions that advance the rights of LGBTQI plus people and other marginalized and vulnerable groups. And she has championed initiatives to combat discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity, promoting the UN's free and equal campaign. She is also a hero to many people within the State Department who see her leadership and her ethics operating every day. And I know from having worked with her team to arranged for her to be here today, how many competing priorities she had. But she insisted that she would make time for this important conversation. Ambassador, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. How many, how many of you have ever said no to her and <laughs> and got away with it. She knows that I didn't have a choice once, <laughs> once she asked me uh, to do this, and I knew that I didn't have a choice. Uh, but I'm here because I want to be here, so thank you so much. Happy Pride, everyone. <laughs> this is better than at USUN when we said Happy Pride and everybody just sat there and you, you had to rear them up. <laughs> Good. 
Well, look, let me start by saying how delighted I am uh, to be here with you this afternoon and to really thank you so much for your being here this afternoon. 45 years ago, just a few blocks south of where we are today, around 100,000 members of the LGBTQI community gathered on the National Mall. They hailed from across the country, around the world, and they sang songs and they offered remarks. And they together in what would become the first national march for LGBTQI plus rights demanded that their voices be heard. As the march continued, there was one chant that caught on. All across the mall, you could hear people saying in unison, we are everywhere. We're everywhere. Lifting up one another and lifting up all of us. To this day, the LGBTQI plus community remains everywhere. Our neighbors, our friends, family members, our teachers, our doctors, diplomats, and representatives in government, ourselves. And the fight, the fight for equal rights, equal dignity, equal protection under the law remains ubiquitous. And this is a fight. It is our fight. Because for all the progress we've made, so much more remains to be done all around the world, including right here in the United States. LGBTQI plus, thank you. <laughs> the LGBTQI plus people will live in fear of hate and of violence. In Russia, Putin has labeled the quote, international LGBT public uh, movement as extremist, as an extremist organization. After the ruling, one woman was tossed in jail for days. Her crime, wearing rainbow earrings. In Afghanistan, members of the LGBTQI plus community have reported sexual and physical assault. Others now live in hiding and then there are those who have gone missing and are believed to be dead. In Uganda last year's passage of a draconian anti-gay law has led to hundreds of evictions, arrests, and cases of violence against the LGBTQI uh, plus community. And here in the United States, a small but vocal, small but odious, small but dangerous group of people continues to target the LGBTQI plus community and especially trans individuals. The protests that took to the mall in 1979 demanded that we protect young people. We protect them from laws that are used to discriminate, oppress and harass them in their homes, in their communities, in their schools. And yet, all these years later, we've seen an alarming rise in hate crimes at schools, especially in states where LGBTQI plus students face restrictive laws. But despite these challenges, the LGBTQI plus community has shown remarkable bravery and resilience. And we have, <clears throat> and we have seen all over the world the impact of their advocacy, the impact of your advocacy. Over the past year alone, Greece and Estonia legalized same-sex marriage, while France welcomed its first gay prime minister and Latvia its first gay president. Germany. Germany passed a law allowing transgender people to, uh, to more easily change their legal gender, and Dominica decriminalized consensual same-sex conduct. And just last week, and we got applause at the UN for this, Jessica, Thailand's legislature moved forward an historic bill to make the first Southeast Asian country to legalize same-sex marriage. I gotta put on my glasses now. <laughs> These are victories for human rights, but they're also victories for democracy and development, national security, and good governance. 
Studies have found that greater inclusion of LGBTQI plus people in emerging economies has been positively associated with a country's economic development and its democratic norms. On the flip side, human rights violations experienced by the LGBTQI plus people diminish economic output and provide a bellwether of democratic backsliding and of increased risk to other marginalized communities. The benefits of inclusion, the benefits of inclusivity, of equal rights are clear. But that's not to say this work is easy. In fact, it's just the opposite. I think about my colleague, David Pressman, the United States Ambassador to Hungary. A few years ago, as he was being confirmed, a message floated down the Danube River past the embassy in Budapest. And it said, and I quote, Mr. Pressman, don't colonize Hungary with your cult of death. You see, Ambassador Press Pressman is a gay man. And in the years preceding his arrival in Budapest, the government passed laws specifically targeting people like him, banning discussion of LGBTQI plus issues in schools, limiting the ability of gay parents to adopt, defining marriage as between one man and one woman. And yet, Ambassador Pressman has continued to stand strong in the face of suppression and intimidation, speaking out against these laws and threats to Hungary's democracy, marching alongside 30,000 Hungarians in Budapest's Pride Parade. I think about Ambassador Barry, who's in Namibia, who was told the government there would not give a visa for his husband to accompany him. Luckily, we were able to convince them otherwise, and now Randy and his husband are welcome in the community in Namibia. They are, in fact, an asset. I think of all the gay foreign service officers in the past who could have, who should have, become ambassadors and never made it because the system discriminated against them. There's so much work to be done, but I am really proud that the uh, the international LGBTQI plus community has an ally in the Biden administration. On his first day in office, President Biden charged our government with preventing and combating discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. And while the secretary spoke to some of the work being done to that end, I wanna take a special moment to acknowledge the ways in which the United Nations mission to the United Nations, the United States mission to the United Nations has led on that front. There's our team itself. I talk often about the power of representation, about how critical it is to have a team as diverse as the country we represent, elevating stories that have for, for far too long gone unheard and fighting for the rights and freedoms we all deserve. I couldn't be more proud. I couldn't be more grateful to count so many members of the LGBTQI community as colleagues and allies in this work at our mission in New York. And I want to give them a hand of applause. They have been among those leading the charge at the, United, at the United Nations to not only advance human rights, but make clear the inextricable link between our fundamental freedoms and international peace and security. Together with a group of allied countries known as the UN LGBTI core group, we hosted the second ever UN Security Council ARIA meeting on the LGBTQI plus issues, calling on the council to regularly incorporate this work in our agenda. In the Human Rights Council, the US lobbied in support of the first ever UN resolution on intersex persons that was adopted without a single no vote. And we fought and won 
in the Economic and Social Council to preserve language on sexual orientation and gender identity in the text of a resolution on elections. Since the General Assembly adopted that resolution, we've seen more LGBTQI plus people take elected office at every level of government. We need to follow the example of these leaders who are fighting for progress in their communities and who are working to uphold and defend the universal human rights of all LGBTQI people. All of this to say, there is so much to celebrate this month, but so much more work needs to be done together in the months ahead. So let me end where I started and thank all of you. Let me thank you for everything you do to ensure that every person can live and love with pride, for following in the footsteps of those marchers out on the National Mall 45 years ago, and for being here and being everywhere. With that, I'll turn the floor back over to Jessica. Thank you. Well, you know, that was so powerful, now we get a break to absorb it. So everyone, please take a 10 minute break, enjoy coffee and water, and then we'll resume at whatever 10 minutes from now is.